Hey there, welcome to the special episode of Polysthetic. It's a bit out of ordinary, but I got a special request from a follower on my website to create a video tutorial for the pixel style buildings that I put together for my two years of YouTube video. If you'd like to skip ahead to the content, please check the timestamps in the description below. So if you haven't seen that video, it's of a pixelated cyberpunk type city. The, it's built through low poly 3D models and pixel perfect low resolution textures. Combination of low poly art and pixel art basically. And this is a style that's gaining a bit of traction to the standalone app Crocotile and through the Blender plugin Spritile. Now you don't have to use any plugins or special software to achieve this style. And indeed, I actually find it easier to use Blender's inbuilt UV mapping to achieve this effect. Now, Sprite Tile works well when you have a very specific use case, that is a tile map, and you want to detail a very large environment, something that you could use for, say, an exploration game. However, for this purposes, you, you may be better off just using it, Blender's built-in tools. <clears throat> but however, I will demonstrate both ways in this video, just to get an idea. The bulk of the heavy lifting will be done by the artwork itself, so if your pixel art skills are good, they'll come out looking good. And the other part of it is what kind of maps you're going to use on top of the pixel texture. So your roughness, your bump met metalness, and your luminosity maps in particular. You'll, f you'll probably find a use for all four of them, depending on your desired end product. Alright, switch over to the screen. Now I'm going to assume that before you start this tutorial you have your own pixel art ready to go. I'm just going to demonstrate the how to put these buildings together and these buildings are just cuboids. Normally you draw a net of a 3D object, so your top, uh, your four sides and maybe your bottom, though in this case I just delete the bottom because you don't see them. And if your model looks the same from all four sides, all you really need to do is draw the top and one of the sides, a typical side, and then just apply that same texture all around. All right, and I'm also gonna assume they are an absolute beginner with Blender. I'm not gonna show all of the basics, but I'm gonna walk through some of the shortcuts that will help you in your future modeling and describe what I'm doing on screen as much as I can. All right, so this is where we're starting. Now we're not gonna be using the animation here. So let's switch this to the, to the shader editor. And I'm going to need to map the UV texture to the models as well. So I'm going to hold my mouse here until I've got the crosshairs and I'm click and drag. And I'm going to change this one to the UV editor. Let's pull this down for now. So we've got the default cube here. One of the first things I do, you'll note that the origin is at the center of the cube, which is that yellow dot right there. However, it's better to move the origin towards the bottom of, of your shape. That way when you move your building around or scale it, let's always scale from the bottom. So I'm gonna click this object, press tab, which takes us into edit mode. Alternatively, you can just click here and select edit mode. I'm gonna to switch to the face selection mode and I'm gonna select the bottom face. Now I'm going to press G to move it press Z to lock it in the Z axis and I'm going to type in one that'll move it one unit upwards precisely and then we hit enter and we've got the face moved up and we haven't affected the origin so it's at the base of the model now the next thing I'm going to do is as I mentioned earlier just delete that bottom face so I'm going to press X and delete the face so now we've got this shell of a model now you can do this another way Alternatively, you can do this. You can go back into object mode, click options, and affect only the origin. And so if we hit G again, and then Z, we're moving the origin up and down. However, we want it to snap to the absolute bottom of this mesh. So what we can do is click on this button here, the snapping, and snap to vertex. And snap with the closest, if we hit G, Z, and hold the control button, notice how it snapped to the bottom right corner. Well, because we've locked it in the Z, it's only moving up and down. And we've got our origin reset there. Cool. Gonna delete that bottom face. And now let's click here, 
to open up our transform panel and I'm just going to set it to zero. Next thing we're going to do is assign a material to this cube. So with it clicked, click on the material properties panel here. It's got already got a default material, so we'll work with that. Let's pull this up. Now in here, we're going to load our pixel map. So press shift A and we're just going to search in this case. Search for an image texture. Load your texture and map it to the color node. And to preview how your material looks, switch over to viewport shading here. There you go. Now you'll notice uh, two things. One of them is the transparent parts of your PNG texture are non-transparent here. So to fix that, map your alpha output of your texture into the alpha input of the principled BSDF shader here. While you're here, scroll down into settings, blend mode, alpha clip. Now the reason we do this is because these settings apply to the EV rendering engine, not cycles. So if you don't do this and render in the cycles engine, it will come out as, uh, as transparent as well. This is purely for our viewport display. It'll make it a lot simpler. The other thing you'll notice is that there's anti-aliasing. So you're losing the crispness of your pixel uh, texture. Uh, all you need to do is go into your texture interpolation drop down here and click closest. Now your textures are pixel perfect. Now let's load the image that we're looking at here. So let's say we want to make this blue building here. The easiest way to do this, let's click this here. So we're facing front on and press tab. So we're in edit mode and let's press A. So we select everything. Now you can right click, go into UV unwrap faces and project it from view, which means the direction that we're looking at here is how these textures are going to be projected, the direction of the camera. Now we can move this there. However, you'd want it to, to look pixel perfect. So go click on UV, snap to pixel setting and set it to corner. Now, when you move around, you'll notice that it'll snap to the pixel grid. Let's press S to scale it, X to scale it in the X direction. And we'll move the, them right there. Let's pull these down with G and Y as we're moving in the Y direction. Pull that to the bottom. Select these two, G, Y to the top. Now, let's scale our cuboid vertically up so it doesn't look squashed. So I can press S and then Z to scale upwards, just like that. Alternatively, you can tweak this value. Now this looks okay from two directions because we projected along that direction. However, these ones are projected either here or here. So this face is flat along this corner, along this edge. This one is flat along this edge. So how do we project both of these at the same time? Well, what you can do is select the X-ray toggle. And this allows you to see through the geometry and pick faces that are behind and just make selection a lot quicker. So press X and now we're facing this side of the cube and we can drag over this handle here and we'll end up selecting both sides. And similarly, we can just project this from view. Press A to select everything, press G to move, and then we map this again. There you have it. And the top, 
we can toggle off x-ray mode now select the top cube let's click on z then project from view move this out here press s there you have it that's the model pretty straightforward now you don't have to project from view there are other projection modes so say for example we select all of them and we choose a cube projection and this unwraps it unwraps it like a net and then you can adjust each face uh, individually I just think projection from view is quickest for me so that's the traditional modeling technique let's have a look at how the sprite tile plugin works so you can download sprite tile from the itch.io page you get a zip archive go into edit preferences go into your add-ons click on install navigate to your zip file and when you do that you'll get a check uh, item a checkbox item check the box that will activate the plugin so to start with sprite tile you have to start with a mesh object so let's just start with a cube tab into it so we're in edit mode and press X to delete all the faces be mindful that you're, you have to be in edit mode so you're deleting the actual mesh but not the object so we're still in this mesh for now I'm just gonna drag this out and pull this down for now now you've got a spry tile panel here click on that and we're gonna add a new tile set now when you do that what Spritar will do is generate a material for you and this material is an emissions material which means it's completely unshaded so it will not respond to any incoming light uh, it won't be it won't have any shadows or anything like that so you can use the material that, that it creates for you or just use this the material we created earlier as that will behave more physically accurate and to build something you use the sprite tile build tool so we've got this little grid here scroll wheel over it to make it bigger or smaller hold shift and middle click to move it and that's it really so let's make the green one this time now these are 16 by 16 so i'm going to change the grid size to 16 and 16. select like that one and depending on your uh, camera angle sprite tile will automatically change the orientation of the plane in which you add the faces and so all you need to do is click and that would create that now it creates planes at the 3d cursor which is that red red and white sphere that you see there but what if I wanted to uh, move that cursor the quickest way is by pressing s and moving the holding S and moving the cursor there. Let's rotate. Press S again to move the cursor to the corner here. And there we go. Now let's click on this other tile and you can hold click and build three at the same time or as many as you want at the same time. not always responsive so requires a little bit of patience yeah and then we'll move the cursor up here select that final bit now you'll notice this isn't perfectly lined up with the roof what we can do is just click on this little drop down extra grid UV settings and we're gonna offset the Y by one pixel and that perfectly lines up with the roof tab out of the tool and there you have it looks a bit odd here but we'll, we'll let it go for now and this mesh is all connected and that's the basics of how to use sprite tile I won't go through everything but th this should be enough to get you started there are there is a written guide and a video guide on the official plugin website however as you may have noticed sprite tile works best when you respect the dimensions of the grid so it's best to work with 32 by 32 16 by 16 
and make sure every square on your pixel map corresponds to a segment of the texture that's usable. Now I didn't do that with this pixel map, so I learned that lesson the hard way. In future, for something like this, I'd prefer to use Blender's build-in tools, but there are specific applications to Sprite Tile where it would come in use. Now let's go back to our other building. What if I wanted to make this double the height? There are two ways I'll show you how to do this. Let's go into, this is technique number one. Let's look at the loop cut tool. Make sure the number of cuts is at one. And I'm just gonna hover over this part of the mesh and click once. And this has cut the faces into two. And now we can individually retexture these faces. So let's say we drag it down there. And for this one, we drag it up there. So now the building look, will look a bit taller when we scale it up. However, it would be tedious to do the, all three sides. So let's look at a way that we can shortcut this process. So let's select this face, this face and the roof. Press Control I. What this does is inverts our selection. So it selects every other face. Press the X button and then delete all the faces. Okay. So we're going to fix this with rotational symmetry. Now we want to rotate these two faces by 90 degrees three times about their origin. The way to do that is press shift S. And what we can, we have to do is select cursor to world origin. What this does is it resets the 3d cursor back to zero, zero, zero. Alternatively, you can go into the view panel here and set the 3D cursor location manually. Click on this option here and set it to 3D cursor. What this does is, is it makes our movements, our rotations and our scaling relative to the location of the 3D cursor, not to the median point of the selection. And by doing this, so let's duplicate these two faces, press hold shift, press D, Notice we've got a copy, but we want to, this to be rotated. And we want it to be rotated about the Z axis. Like that. Now type 90, 90. You can check that you've written it up there in the top left corner. And we'll press enter. Now just do that again. Shift D to copy. Press R to rotate. Z to rotate about the Z axis and type 90 and we'll do that one more time. Okay, we're almost there. Now there's one thing we have to clean up. That's the vertices. We need to make sure they're all welded, which means they're connected to each other because right now the faces are loose. So the simplest way to do that is press A to select all the faces, go to mesh, go to merge, and merge by distance. Alternatively, just press the M key and click by distance. And you've got this little pop-up here. What you can do is change the merge distance, the tolerance. In this instance, they're very close to each other, so they were already um, close enough such that they were welded. And now if we move a face, you can see that all the connecting faces move as well. Okay, so we looked at one way of how to make this building double the height. Let's look at another way now. And this way is a little simpler. So let's select the model and press tab. Now what we want is to first of all disconnect this roof. So select the roof, go to mesh and split by selection. This disconnects this part of the mesh from the remainder of the mesh. Alternatively, you could have pressed Alt M to split. Okay, say we want to copy these four faces upwards. What you can do is hold Alt and click near the edge of one of these faces. What this does is it loop selects. So there's a loop around the mesh and it selects all of the faces corresponding to that loop. Then press Shift D to duplicate. Press Z to lock it upwards and press first let's move it up here and then we'll press g to move it again press z and 
control to snap to the, this vertex here. Finally, let's select the roof again, press G, Z to lock it in the Z axis and hold control to snap to this vertex. There you go. Now we want to melt the vertices down, weld the vertices down again. So let's press A to select everything. Press M and merge by distance. And just so you can see at the bottom there that eight vertices were removed, which correspond to the new geometry. As you can see, it's all connected. Now let's say we deleted that roof. So we lose that face. What you can do is just select these four vertices again and press F. That will create a new face. Then we can project from view to correct the to correct the texture. That's it. Okay, so that finishes the modeling portion. Uh, next, I'll show you how to build the specialized shader that I put together. Before we get started with the shader editor, uh, let's enable an add-on that will help you visualize what each particular node is doing in the editor. So go to edit. This add-on is built in, by the way. Go to preferences and search for Wrangler, W-R-A-N-G. You can see here in node, node Wrangler and just check that box. Now what this does is when you put in a particular node, the you can preview the data path up until that node. What I mean by that is if you hold control shift and then left click on this one, what this will do is preview this node on any attached objects. To reset it, hold control shift, left click on the final output. That will send it back to the output. So there are multiple maps that you can use. I'll explain the common ones. Let's look at the first one here, metallic. Now materials behave in either two ways. Metallic materials, this is what we call an albedo workflow. These materials don't have an intrinsic color. They're actually black, but the, the specular highlights on the material are, in the, are colored. So for example, gold is actually quite dark, but all of its reflections are yellow. The other material type is dielectrics, and that's everything else, basically. And these have a underlying color, which are technically diffuse reflections of that particular color. And on top of that, they are specular highlights, which are always white. So if your material is metallic, make sure this is all the way to one. And if your material is non-metallic, then send everything back to zero. It's one or zero, not anywhere in between. Now for this texture, I did not create a metallic map, but you can, you can preview what it would look like. In general, it's darker, but what, what the actual difference is, is that the highlights are of that color, not white. So I've got a bump map here, which has values some black some grays so what I can do is add a curve node RGB curves and a node here now if we look at this output here what I've done is I have greatly increased the contrast so that everything is approximately white or approximately black so this is just to demonstrate what you would do when building your own pixel maps, when you have a mixture of metallic and dielectric materials. Where you want a pixel to appear metallic, make sure it is white. Where you want it to appear dielectric, make it black. And here you can see the difference between the two materials. In general, metallic materials appear darker, but at a very smooth roughness, they actually reflect a lot of light. So you can see that there with the cycles uh, rendering engine. Let's increase the, the intensity of that light. So as you can see, the dielectric materials appear white under very intense light, while the metallic materials will only reflect back that color. This is based on physically accurate uh, materials, how things actually operate. 
uh, under the laws of physics. So I won't be using uh, any metalness for these for these buildings. So I'll just crank that back to zero. Now the arguably the most important one is roughness. So now let's feed this bump map, but it actually functions well as a roughness map here. Now what roughness is, as you can see, if, if something's very smooth, it returns specular reflections. So very clean um, reflections, while something that's rough uh, has very diffuse reflections. So in this instance, you can see the light reflected off the window there. So in this instance, this actually works quite well because the windows are all black and because of their glass, so they reflect light very well while everything else is is white or somewhere in between just some gray cubes are not a good way of previewing how roughness works so let's have a look at how a sphere would behave so something that's very smooth has very small and very sharp specular highlights which is this white dot here while increasing the roughness increases the spread of these specular highlights so this is at maximum roughness. Sphere just looks uh, flat and matte. While turning down the ref the roughness, makes it look increasingly glossy. It doesn't look good in this instance because I don't have a realistic lighting setup. If you were to put this under a HDRI, for example, uh, you could really tell the difference, which you can see here with the EVN engine, which has a built-in uh, HDRI map. Okay, so that one was roughness. Let's take a look at bump maps and converting them into normal maps, which Blender does out the box. So let's add, but you need to add an intermediate node here. Shift A, search for bump map. There we go. And we feed the color of this bump map into the height input. And what it will output this node is a normal. Now with a bump map, anything that is black will recede. Anything that is white will stick out and everything in between. So this, this is, was intended to be a bump map. So all the windows are black. You'd want the windows to appear that they recede. And you can see that the light is coming from this direction and this, this, uh, this side because the windows are going in this side of the window seals that's facing the light are illuminated while the ones on the other side are in shadow and that's how you would set up a simple bump map so we've covered metallic roughness now the last one is emission now in the video i mixed a special emissions texture that gave the appearance of light and dark patches in windows as you'd see in a real city so I'll show you how emission maps work first of all and, and they work largely the same way so let's copy this node shift D e. let's open the luminosity image now let's feed the color information into the emission now what you'll notice is that the color of the emission map let's click on it Let's have a look at it here. So everything that I want to be illuminated is white and everything that I don't want to be illuminated to be black. Now this can vary in, in shades in between. So if you want something to be half as luminous, just use a 50% gray and you'd multiply it by this emission strength parameter. So the higher the emission strength, the more light that comes out of these windows. And this will cast onto other objects uh, if you're using the cycles ray tracing engine. So the, the emission will be physically accurate. However, this doesn't look that good because we don't want the lights to be white. But if we were to put the color of the windows into the emission node, everything will be luminous. That won't work. So the way to do this is to actually mix a new emissions texture and mix it in with the principled texture here. Let's create a new emission texture only. Let's feed the color into this node. Let's copy this and we'll choose our luminosity map. Now let's add a new node 
mix shade out and put it in between and we're going to mix the emission node and the principled bsdf node now at the moment they're just mis mixing 50 50 but what you want is this shader here to be masked by this map so if we take the color node and plug it into this factor input what you can see let's crank up the emission you now have a colored emission based on masked by this map so anything that any regions that are white take in input from this shader here the emission and any pixels that are black are only shaded by this shader here so this is a simple way of getting the color of emission that you want and only having some of your model emitting light and so if you were to render this in cycles in particular on on the shadowy side you can see the effects of the emission on the environment it is a blue light being cast on the other objects but how did I get that effect with with the windows being black and white in a pattern and that's procedurally generated so first thing to do let's add a new noise texture Uh, let's preview what we're doing so i'll hold shift control and click that so this is what our noise looks like let's tweak these parameters now the first step is pixelating this texture okay pay close attention what i'm about to do might appear a bit cryptic so first let's add a texture coordinate node next we'll add a value node and let's just set it to some incremental number, let's say 16. Next, we'll add a math node. Now change the mode to divide. Change the first value to 1. And plug in this value here. Next, add a new node. Vector math. Let's just click here for now. I'm going to move these across. Change the mode to snap, plug in this value here into the increment, plug in this value here from the object into the vector, and finally plug this vector here. And as you'll see, we've now pixelated the noise texture, and varying this value here will give you the scale of the pixelation. Now this effect isn't so dramatic, so we'll add a color ramp. Let's go search, color ramp, and adding it here. Crank this up, the contrast by bringing the black and the white closer together. Okay, almost home. Now we want this color ramp output to plug into the strength of the emission so we're varying the strength of the emission node not the mask and not the color just be mindful of that so let's preview our texture now almost there but note here where it's black a black emission shader is something that you don't want because it will be a pitch black void in, in the renders. So the first thing to do is change this rather than going pitch black let's change it to say 0.1 so 10% the brightness. So this goes from 0.2 to 1. The next thing we want to do is multiply this output by any value so that we know the minimum and the maximum range of the emission strength. So let's add a math node here, change the mode to multiply, and we'll set the value to say 15. So then we know that it will go from 
15 times 0 0.2, which is an emission strength of 3, to 15 times 1, which is an emission strength of 15. One more thing I want to show you. Let's say we copy this building. Notice how when we move the object, the pixelated noise texture is randomly generated. So this is a good way of breaking up monotony. Let's say you want to copy this building to make a city. All of them will have their own unique uh, window light up pattern. Okay, well that's all I have for the buildings. Two more things I want to show. One is adding decals. And the other is particle, random particle colors. Okay, let's take a look at this train carriage. What if I wanted to add a texture on top of it, kind of like a decal, so graffiti in this instance. But the pixel resolutions don't actually match up. So rather than modifying the original texture, you can take another texture and apply it to a separate UV map on this object. So the first thing you need to do is click here, go to the mesh uh, object data properties, UV maps, and Create a new UV map. Get that there. Let's call this decal. And you want this to be active so that it will show up on this preview. Okay, let's add a new image. And what you want here is something with a transparent background. Now we want to mix the base color from the pixel map with the color in here. So let's add a mix RGB node. Let's feed this one into here, this one here, and back into there. <clears throat> now nothing happened. So first thing, Let's add a new node, this time called UV map. And here, you're going to select the UV map that you're using. So click on the decal and feed the UV output vector into the input vector of the decal. Then duplicate this UV map node if you don't have any inputs here and change this UV map to the first one and feed them into the inputs of the other images. Make sure your decal is active. Select A. And let's say we project it from this view. So you can see the train carriage is on the side here. If we just expand this. Now notice that it's repeating. We don't want that. We want it to stop at the edges. So here, in the third drop down, the extrapolation just Clip. In this case, you could have also used extend because the edges of this PNG are transparent. But usually, what you'll want is clip. And there you have it. So now you'll see that this is 50 50 of the color map and the decal. What you want instead is to take the alpha output of the decal and feed it into the factor input on the mix node. Now this is backwards, so let's reverse these two. There you go. And just like that, you've got two textures of different resolutions, uh, one sitting on top of the other on the same object using two separate UV maps. And if you only want it on one side of the carriage, I can select this one and move it up. There you go. Okay, the last cool technique I want to show you is setting random colors for part instance particles. In my city video, I had these simple cars uh, emitted as particles, and each of them were generated with a random color on the body. So first thing we're going to do, let's set up a particle emitter. So let's add a new mesh, shift A, mesh, plane. Make this bigger and rotate it this way. With that selected, let's add a new particle system. Go to particle properties, click add, 
let's just reduce the number. Now, what are we emitting? So if you click on render, we can render it as an object, but then we can we only render one at a time. So what we actually want is a collection of cars, a collection of different models that this particle emitter will emit. So let's add under the scene collection a new collection, which we'll call cars. And we'll move car one and car two underneath it. Set this to collection. That collection is cars. Let's bump up the scale. I'm just going to pull up the timeline here. And you'll see cars are flying out of the emitter. Now we don't want the cars to be affected by gravity. So we'll go to the field weights, zero for gravity. There we go. Let's increase the scale. And we'll align it with the global pi. So now we've got these cars. How do we randomize their colors? So let's go into the shader and add a new node. And this time we'll call the particle info node. Now this particle info node has a bunch of outputs that are generated for each particle. As each particle enters the scene, it will carry this information with it. Let's add a HSV node, combine HSV. Let's increase the value to one and the saturation to one, and we'll feed it a random hue. And we'll feed this color into the base color. Now it all looks red, but if you were to render this in cycles, and this only works in cycles, you get a different, you get a random color for each particle. So the only thing left to do is how do we mix this? So let's get a new mix RGB node, add it here and feed this color. And finally, what you need is another pixel map. So let's add an image texture called this the color mask. So I feed the color mask into this factor here and you can see it's backwards. So let's swap these two around and there you go. Let's have a closer look at this mask. Basically anything that you don't want affected by the random color, that is anything that will only take its color from the original pixel art map, you leave it as black. And anything that you want to be recolored by this random color node, uh, make it white. That's how the masking works. So if we were to let this run for a bit, with a lot more cars, and we switch to cycles, you'll see each car has a random color. Awesome. One last thing that was requested for this tutorial was uh, model exports. Now exporting from Blender is very easy. So let's say we wanted to export this model, this building model. Simply go to file, export, and it depends on what your purposes are. Filmbox is why quite often used, however it is a proprietary format. Keep in mind your local transforms. So what you want is your forward direction to be either minus Y or Y, depending on your uh, how you've modeled it in Blender. And then you want your up to be Z up. Same with OBJs. And typically you want to select, check this box, selection only. So only the objects that you've selected with a shift click. You can select multiple objects with a shift click limit to selected objects for FBX, OBJ, limit to selection only. Again, you'd want to set your directions. And if you're working with the Godot engine, simply export using the, the Collada file type. Again, selection only and make sure your forward axis and your up axis are correct. Okay, thank you for watching. If you made it this far, this was a very long video, but uh, hopefully I covered uh, everything in quite a level of detail. But 
you might find useful. This video was requested, so I don't have any intentions of making any more Blender tutorials. Um, if you'd like to see something, you know, send me an email on my website or put a comment. I read all your comments uh, on my channel, so request anything that you'd like. I, I have actually been recording from the start of this year uh, devlogs for a simple game that I'm putting together in the Godot engine and it actually uses this style of 3D modeling. Pixel art textures on low poly models and those devlogs will start being released in June so if you do enjoy these kinds of videos uh, make sure to hit like, subscribe, hit the bell as well you'll be notified when they come out. Thank you for watching, hope you found it useful and I'll see you in the next one.